Are you guys, um, have you ever, are you familiar with the ozone layer at all? Yes. Have you heard of that? I have. Do you know what it is? There's different tones, like, around, around the earth that reflects the, um, UV rays of the sun. Mm -hmm. Close. Yeah, not, it really absorbs them, but the idea is the same, yeah. It's, in a, it's, the ozone layer is a layer of a gas, O3. That's what ozone is, like, you know, we breathe in oxygen, O2. Well, if you add another oxygen atom to O2, it forms O3, which is ozone. Is that bad? It depends. If we were to breathe it in it at ground level where we are, it's bad for our lungs. It's a type of pollution. So that, is that but, why there's like a thing so it keeps it like at a certain level? So we well, like sometimes it. there's um, in certain areas, like they announce the ozone level so if it's high you don't go outside and exercise because you don't want to breathe in that pollution like smog is part part, part of smog if you've heard of that is ozone smog, smog. smog. What is that? it's like a type of pollution that comes we don't really have much of it around from, here like, from cars and and pollution oh, reacting with sunlight yeah but this is something different so that ozone that we're just talking about there's also a layer of it way up high in the atmosphere where it's it's not, we don't breathe it in or anything. It's way in the stratosphere, but it's helpful because ozone, this gas, can absorb ultraviolet radiation, and that's important. Like the sun? Yes, ultraviolet radiation from the sun. So there's like a layer of this ozone gas around the um, in the upper layers of the atmosphere, and it protects us from ultraviolet radiation. Do you have the hard copy by accident, I guess? Do I? I do. Um, oh. So why is that good, to, good that it absorbs, good morning, that it absorbs ultraviolet radiation? Yeah. Not, it's not really related to temperature. Prevents us from cooking. Sort of, but not by us heating up. What it, yeah, ultraviolet radiation is what can give us first a suntan or a sunburn, or if you get repeated sunburns, you increase the risk of skin cancer. Okay, so excess ultraviolet radiation. Thank you. Um, can increase the risk of skin cancer in humans, but also it can affect other organisms. It can kill plankton in the oceans, this radiation. So the this layer of ozone gas helps protect us, right? It's like a shield from this radiation that's constantly coming from the sun. The problem is humans started producing these chemicals that destroy the ozone layer. They didn't really know this at the time, but these chemicals are called CFCs. They don't really exist in nature. Humans created them for different uses. Um, and when these CFCs get up into the stratosphere, they break down the ozone layer. And so humans for a long time were using lots of these CFCs. They are used in air conditioning units. Like Katie, you're interested in cars sometimes. Have you heard of Freon? Is in like air conditioning units of cars. Sometimes you have to like get it recharged. It's also in um, air conditioners and, and freezers. It used to be an aerosol form also. And so we were using a lot of these chemicals and over time they were eroding the ozone layer up high in the atmosphere. And there was increased ultraviolet radiation reaching the earth. Um, so that's bad. There's a hole actually in the ozone yeah. layer. In Antarctica, over Antarctica, there's a hole that opens up every year um, because that's where these gases collect and they destroy it. Um, and so you can see this is in 2006. That's how big the hole in the ozone layer was. So in this area, that means ultraviolet radiation can, can get into the earth at a much higher rate, and that's bad for all organisms. So in 1987, um, countries from around the world came together in Montreal, Canada, as they realized that this is a problem and they came up with an agreement. 
uh, it was called the Montreal Protocol. And basically these countries said, we're going to stop using CFCs for these certain uses uh, and try to find alternatives. And so countries all came together and agreed. And actually since then, there has been improvement that because we stopped using these chemicals, the ozone layer is starting to heal. Scientists think by 2050 or so, it'll be sort of fully recovered. So this is a good example of like, if so we talk about these environmental problems, like we were yesterday and we are today, but if countries can come together and agree to take action, they can have a positive change in these environmental issues. And this is a good example of that. <clears throat> so that's ozone depletion. Any questions about that? <clears throat> okay. Did I, I thought I had acid rain in there. Did I not? Oh, did I skip that? We didn't do acid precipitation yesterday, did we? No. Okay. I, I started in the wrong spot. So we'll go back. Have you ever heard of acid rain? Yes. I, so, um, so a lot of times people have the wrong impression. Sometimes people think like acid rain means like if it's raining out and you go outside, it's going to like hurt your skin. And like, it's, that's not how intense the acidity is in acid precipitation. No, it's just the wind, before, right. Like, like for plants and stuff. Yeah. And if it gets in the water and you go in there, it can hurt you. Not, it wasn't really, it never gets to the level where it's going to harm like us and our skin and so forth. It harms, yeah, ecosystems. But why, do you know what causes acid rain or acid precipitation? Like what's going on that makes the rain acidic? Factory plus cloud. Yeah, when there's like smoke and it starts raining, it can become acid yeah. rain yeah. because of the um, chemicals. In yeah. Not, and not just from factories. What's another thing that produces? Car. Yeah. Cars are a big part of it too, I said. Yeah. Because everyone drives them 24-7. Right. And so, yeah, acid rain or acid precipitation, it's sometimes called, because snow can actually be a setup too, um, is caused by two chemicals, really, sulfur and nitrogen. <clears throat> Fossil fuels in them contain sulfur and nitrogen. Coal especially has high amounts of sulfur usually. Gasoline has high levels of nitrogen. And so when we drive our cars or when factories burn coal or power plants burn coal, sulfur and nitrogen get up into the atmosphere. They're in the emissions from those. And they combine with water and they form sulfuric acid or nitric acid. And that acid falls to the earth when it rains or snows. And so like Isaiah was saying earlier, when this acid precipitation falls on different ecosystems, can harm them, right? Some animals are very sensitive to acidity or the, a low pH. Um, especially if it builds up. One area we see this is that in the winter, for example, in the Adirondacks, the soils don't have the ability to absorb a lot of acid because their soils are not thick and the soils are already acidic a little bit. So in the winter, as all this snow is building up in a typical winter, in the spring when it melts, all of that water comes into lakes and streams. And if that snowpack was acidic because of acid precipitation, it can make the lakes and streams very acidic. And that can kill organisms, can kill algae, it can make it so certain fish species can't survive. Um, and so it's, definitely a problem in our area in the adirondacks especially because they are vulnerable to this so it also has effects like eroding um some certain types of stonework like have you ever have you ever like gone into like a cemetery and see old gravestones that are like white in color almost 
and the words are like worn away. Yeah, because they used to make those those gravestones out of limestone, which interacts very strongly with acid. And so when acid rain hits those, it eroded them very quickly. Um, so we can help improve this problem by using less fossil fuels. Okay, so by you know using more um, electric vehicles, by making cars more efficient, how they use gasoline. By there's also equipment that can be installed in power plants or factories that remove some of the sulfur or nitrogen from the emissions, and all of those things can help improve this problem. And this shows sort of where in the United States, um, it shows the acidity of the rain. And you can see the orange colors are where the uh, precipitation is most acidic. And obviously it's right around where we live, right? Um, and you can see the Western and Midwest part of the country is, are not as affected by acid rain. And part of this is because of the winds in the US, pretty much the prevailing winds go from West to East. So any pollution produced in like the Midwest gets blown over to the East Coast and, and ends up often affecting the East Coast more. And this shows sort of how organisms tolerate acidity. So remember seven is neutral for pH. That means zero acidity. And a low number means something's more acidic. So at pH of 6.5, and for example, in a lake, all of these species can survive those conditions. But as the water becomes more acidic, if it goes down to 5.5, these freshwater mussels, they can't survive anymore. If it gets even more acidic at a pH of 5, now the bass can't survive and the mayfly. And as we get more and more acidic, what you see is only a couple things can survive those conditions. And as we talked about yesterday, if we species can't survive, that can affect the entire ecosystem because of the connections between all of the species. <sighs> okay, and our last, our last environmental issue that we're gonna talk about is climate change. So climate change is something I'm sure you, you've heard of. Um, so climate change, like, what do you, if you had to put it in words, what does that mean? I think you were talking about it yesterday, Isaiah, when we were talking about other things. Like, what's happening to the Earth's climate? Uh, it's getting hotter. Okay, it's getting warmer. That's the first step, right? That our Earth, our average temperature throughout the entire Earth is increasing. How come? So there's like dust on the floor. So from the factory and causing it to get hotter. Yeah, let's let's fill that in a little bit. Why? Like what is actually the fossil fuels that's from the earth that's not too healthy for the Yeah, burning fossil fuels environment. So it's not releases something a specific gas that's leading the climate change. Carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is a gas. It's released when you burn anything. There's other gases as well, but we'll focus on, on carbon dioxide. And so we are adding huge amounts of carbon dioxide to the atmosphere, exactly like Isaiah said. As we take fossil fuels out of the ground, right? they have carbon in them, but it's buried underground. It's not doing anything. But when we dig it out of the ground, or if we pump oil or gas out of the ground and burn it, we're releasing that carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. And what carbon dioxide does is it traps heat. It's like a blanket. And imagine adding carbon dioxide to the atmosphere is like adding thickness to the blanket. You know, if you just had a thin blanket, it wasn't really keep you very warm. But if you had a nice, thick, fluffy blanket, it's going to keep you really warm. That's the same sort of thing that happens with carbon dioxide. If we add carbon dioxide to the atmosphere, it traps more and more heat. So if we look at the history of the Earth, carbon dioxide levels have gone up and down in the past, before humans were even on the Earth. You can see this blue line shows carbon dioxide levels. 
And this is 400,000 years ago. So it's gone down, gone up and down and up. Okay. Um, and usually when it goes down the history of the earth, there's been ice ages because there's less carbon dioxide. That blanket is thin. And so the earth has gone through ice ages over the past hundreds of thousands of years that you probably have heard about. But if we look at modern times, so we have these cycles up and down and up and down and up and down, up, but then look at where we are now. We're all the way up here. So we've sort of broken out of this usual cycle that has been going on for a long period of time, and we're going way beyond it. So these, and this shows like more recent times. You can see a thousand years ago, the amount of carbon dioxide, and then the sudden increase here around the 1800s. Again, what happened then in the 1800s? The, we started producing all of this carbon dioxide. Make yeah what okay yeah what what do you what's the event you probably learned about in social studies that happened in the 1800s when humans started using coal and other fuels? Yeah, the industrial revolution. Humans started using mechanization and factories and electricity and all these things that they fueled using fossil fuels. So the process by which carbon dioxide traps heat, it's called the greenhouse effect. And the way it works is like a greenhouse. Um, you know, if you, have anyone ever been in a greenhouse? If it's sunny out, what's it like in the greenhouse? It's warm, it's moist, but it's sealed up. Yeah, it's because the greenhouse lets ultraviolet radiation and, and radiation from the sun in through the glass. But then the heat that's released is trapped because it's sealed up. And so that allows the temperature to build up. And the same is true of carb that's how carbon dioxide works. It lets radiation from the sun in, but then traps the heat. So we can see this is the sun's radiation coming in. Okay. And then we can see these greenhouse gases absorb that heat. And the more greenhouse gases, the more heat is absorbed. And that leads to the increase in temperature. Is that absorbing carbon goes away? It's the because carbon dioxide absorbs heat. In the, in the greenhouse, you mean? Yeah. Um, no. no. So it's just sort of an analogy. Like the, green, the, the carbon dioxide is like the glass of the greenhouse. It lets sun's energy in but doesn't let the heat out. So how much is the earth warming? Well, sometimes it doesn't seem like the numbers are that much. So the predictions are the temperature of the earth is likely going to rise from 1.5 degrees Celsius to 6.4, 2 degrees Fahrenheit to 11.5 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, what, why is there such a big range? What does this depend on? So I'm saying by 2100, the temperature may increase 1.5 degrees all the way up to 6.4. What's gonna change it? Yeah, what can keep us at the low end? If we don't use as much fossil fuel as we're using right now. Exactly. Because there's a lot of stuff that we're using, but the most that we're using we would say is cars because mm, almost everyone in the world drives cars or boats or there's yeah. thousands of factories and it's dangerous. Uh, yeah, our actions that we take over the next you know, 30 or 40 years will have an effect on what happens with the temperature. Here is a graph of temperature. So we can see this is since the Industrial Revolution, basically. We can see where we're headed in terms of our temperature increase. So how much that how much happens, how much warming there is, depends on basically what we do. Um, if we do no changes, if we have no, if we say, all right, well, we don't really care about climate change. We're just going to keep doing everything the same. 
That's what these red lines represent, more warming. Or we might make adjustments. What are adjustments that we might make to reduce the, the effects of climate change? Like, what can we do as a... Using our oil. How, though? Like, how could we do that, Isaiah? Substituting for something less harmful to the earth. Okay, so, yeah, we can use, try to use less oil or coal or natural gas. What are alternatives? Like, what can we use instead of gasoline in a car? Or how can we get electricity if we're not going to burn coal? Wind farm, water farm, uh, algae fuels. Yeah, when we looked at that slide yesterday, right, Windmills. we talked about renewable energy and those wind turbines, and right? They can use wind energy and generate electricity. And that doesn't release any carbon dioxide. Those solar panels we looked yeah. at, they can produce electricity without any carbon dioxide being emitted. Uh, geo, um, geothermal or water power. So there are some alternatives that we can use. Um, and so the question is, are we going to increase our use of renewables and decrease our use of fossil fuels? Lots of people are arguing for that. Whether we do it or not is still sort of to be seen. Um, but if we're going to um, have significant effects and reduce climate change, then we need to take action pretty quickly because we've been putting it off. I learned about climate change in when I was an, an environmental studies major in 1992. We knew about all of this. And basically, we didn't do anything for 15 years, 20 years. We're really starting to seriously talk about it now, 30 years later. But we've already put a lot of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere because we didn't make adjustments early on. So what happens if the climate warms? Like somebody will say, well, it's cold. It's cold out today walking to school. I want it to be warmer. Well, there's a lot of other factors that go on besides just it's a little bit warmer. And Isaiah, you mentioned this the other day. As the earth gets warmer, ice melts, right? So the, the glaciers at the North and South Pole um, are melting at a very uh, fast yeah. rate. Antarctica at the South Pole, ice on top of land is melting at a fast rate. And as water heats up, it expands. So sea level is rising. It's, um, you can see since 1880 in this graph, this is the change in sea level. And change that means as sea level rises, coastal areas will flood. Like what we were talking about yesterday, the places that have more, um, places where they have to use boats to get around. Oh yeah. That's flooding more, more than it needs to because of the, um, yeah, exactly. Um, areas and we and humans live on the coast a lot. Every, you know, if you think about like major cities in the U.S., lots of them are on the coast, right? New York City or Boston or Miami. Um, these are coastal cities. And so as sea level rises, those areas may be more prone to flooding or some nations are island nations. Indonesia, for example, is a, a nation that's all small islands in Southeast Asia. And so island nations are really concerned about climate change because they can lose their entire country, can be underwater if sea level increases. Yeah. Um, and also, as the temperature of the earth increases, the oceans become warmer. And storms get their energy from the heat in the ocean. So when there's more heat, that means the storms will be more powerful and right. can damage more. Yeah, things like hurricanes. The prediction is that there's going to be more intense hurricanes as the Earth's oceans warm up. And yeah. then a lot of more stuff is going yeah. to also, be destroyed because they don't know that they need to start um, using less uh, dangerous gases so it won't be as bad. Yeah, and, and the other thing related to that is that like 
if let's say a small country, let's say the country of um, Costa Rica or whatever, small country reduces the amount of carbon dioxide they're putting in the atmosphere. Well, there's all the other countries of the earth that have to do the same thing in order to make a significant change. So because like carbon dioxide just spreads throughout the whole globe. So it doesn't like stay above one country. So what one country does affects every other country. And so it takes um, uh, cooperation between different countries to have a positive effect. But everyone wants to seem like they're right, so they're not going to get to an agreement. Well, there are efforts for countries to come to an agreement. Like it, the, if you've ever heard of the Paris Treaty, which happened, you know, um, you know, five or six years ago, um, where countries come together and try to make an agreement as to how they're going to limit carbon dioxide emissions. Also, as ecosystems warm up, as the earth warms up, ecosystems change, right? The type of animals that are adapted to living here, if our temperature change, our climate changes, they may no longer be able to survive. Or, or like or insects that carry disease can expand their range and can bring new diseases into an area. Animals that depend on really cold conditions may be, become extinct, right? Because as the earth gets warmer, those ecosystems may disappear. Um, so it affects, it also affects humans, not just ecosystems, you know, agriculture changes. As um, the earth warms, there could be more droughts, which make it more difficult to produce food. The growing season storms, changes. The storms, they destroy everything. Right, storms, floods, um, lack of drinking water. So there's all sorts of effects that can happen um, that also affect humans, not just sort of natural ecosystem. So the question is, so how, how can we address some of these? We talked about a whole bunch of environmental problems. Um, how can we affect them? Well, there's lots of different things that can happen. We, in almost, in many of them, whether it's ozone layer, acid rain, um, climate change, if we can use less fossil fuels, that improves all of those different problems. So the use of fossil fuels is a huge issue. And the faster we can transition to some other source of energy, the quicker we can improve some of these environmental issues. Um, doing things like using resources um, more efficiently, recycling material instead of getting new materials, um, trying to use um, fewer disposable items. Um, there's laws that can be passed. Like we talked yesterday about the Endangered Species Act, which helped to save things like the bald eagle and other species. So we can have laws that help protect species or help limit pollution. Countries can come together, as we talked about today, to agree to um, take action to improve on some of these uh, some of these issues. So there are things that can happen and people are talking about some of these things more and more and people are having a, a greater interest in addressing uh, these environmental issues. Any questions? Okay. That's the last notes you're going to do in this class this year.